Good afternoon, Fellowship. A warm welcome to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. It is our hope that God will use this time to give us all opportunity to know Him better so that we may love Him more and that we may be equipped and encouraged to do the work He calls us to do. One reminder that I wanted to share with you, you all received a note this week uh, advising that we will be proceeding with the election for elders and deacons, and we plan to do that this week. An email will be sent out on Church Social, which will contain a link that you can use to vote. That will be sent out tomorrow, and we encourage all of you to do your part, so stay home and vote, and help us to make this electronic process as smooth as possible. With that in mind, we wanted to pray together, asking God to bless this election. In Ephesians 4, we read that Christ gives leaders to the church as a gift. And then he goes on to say, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This week, we will have the privilege of voting for some new elders and deacons in Fellowship Church. This is a serious responsibility because we believe that the care of the church is a serious calling from God. It requires people who love God and desire to serve him and his church. So let's pray together for God's blessing on the election. Our Father in heaven, we know that this is your church and that you continue to watch over this church. We are thankful for the gifts that you give to your church. And this afternoon, we want to thank you specifically for the gift of leadership. Thank you that you provide leaders in your church, people who love you and who desire to serve you and your church. This week, Fellowship Church will be voting for some new leaders, and so we want to pray for your blessing. We pray for strong participation that each of us may want to be involved in this process and may take the time to vote. We pray for wisdom and humility for all of us as we assess these men based on the qualifications in your word. We pray for each of the men nominated that you will give them a growing desire to serve your church, that they may accept your direction through this vote, and that they may do that with wisdom and humility. And we pray for our current leaders, that you will give us wisdom and humility to serve you well, and a growing love for you and your people. Thank you, Father, that you care and provide for your church. As we gather for worship this afternoon, we pray for Pastor Tony. Thank you for his generosity to help, his desire to serve you and your church. And we pray that you will equip him today as he leads us in worship. We pray for our musicians as well. Thank you for their gifts and their desire to use their time and talent to serve you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon, Pastor Tony will preach a message about crops and our labor. This is something that we typically do in the spring or in the fall, and he thought it would be timely to use this time to reflect on what work is and why we work and how we can work in hope. In Romans 11, we are reminded that everything comes from God and is intended for his glory. Everything that includes the coronavirus, and that also includes our daily work. And so even in our daily work, we need to do it in a way which brings glory to God, which worships God in our work. That's hard, especially some days, especially at times like this. So let's listen to our call to worship this afternoon with this encouragement that everything, including our work, is intended for God's glory. We read in Romans 11 and 12, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decision and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him, and everything exists by his power, and everything is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. And so, 
Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Let's worship God with the music and words of our opening song, Your Labor is Not in Vain. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Lift up your hearts to the Lord. And as we come before the Lord in worship, we confess our dependence on Him. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Receive now the greeting blessing of the Lord our God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now sing a song of response to this greeting of our Lord. We'll sing Psalm 47, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Let's now come before the Lord in prayer and ask for a blessing over this time. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify your holy name. We thank you, Father, that we can know you, that we can know the wonder of who you are, that we can know the beauty of your grace, and that we can experience your love and your care in our lives. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to bless us as we worship you, we recognize we're getting together and worship in ways that we're not used to, uh, in ways where it's, it's difficult for us to, to just connect with what, what we normally do in a worship service. And so we pray, Lord, that in these exceptional times, you would still bless us and be pleased to use this worship service. We pray that you would bless us as we open up your word. We pray that you would bless us as we hear the word proclaimed. We also pray that you would bless us as we sing songs to you and in our homes as we, as we praise you, but also as we encourage each other in song. Father, give us strength to do it, and may you bless it. May it be a blessing to us, and may we be a blessing to others as we do this. We pray, Father, that you would open our minds and our hearts to hear the gospel and that we would be encouraged and transformed by the proclamation of the gospel. Father, please hear our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon, we're going to be hearing the gospel as it comes to us in Colossians 3, verse 17. And this afternoon, we're, we're going to have a crops and labor uh, service, crops and labor message, and it's going to look at the place of work. What has God given us in work? What's God's vision for work? What's the place of work in our lives? And how does the gospel relate to that? And so I'd like to work with Colossians 3 as we do that. And so I'd like to read with you Colossians 3. We'll read verses 1 through 17. This is God's Word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, 
anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is God's Word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're in the middle of, a, of an unprecedented crisis. What's going on right now with COVID-19 is, is something like we've never seen before in terms of how we've responded as a society, uh, the impact it's had on our, our lives, our jobs, our, the way we worship. And so it's also a good time for us to reflect on many things. You know, we've had to reflect on, on how we function as a church. We've had to reflect on, on how we live as a family, how we live together. It's also a good time to reflect on our work. And this is a good time to do so because there's a lot going on. You know, right now we're, we're dealing with fear. You know, we have the, the inability to do our work. Our, our jobs are under siege. Our economic future is uncertain. You know, there's frustration. You know, the work that we do is difficult. It's trying. You know, we're frustrated. Whatever job that you have, whatever job you do, whether it's a, it's a homemaker, whether or not you're an executive, whether or not you're an employer, an employee, your job has changed. Relationships are frayed. Your work is harder. It's different. It seems to be endless and futile. And we also feel powerless. You know, we're simply put, we're confronted with our own ability, or our inability to do anything about the situation we're in. We can complain about it. We can be worried about it. But we feel so small and insignificant, and our work seems so small. And there's a certain restlessness that comes with it. Not being able to work in some ways has made us appreciate work a little more and want to work. So this is a good time to reflect on work. What is work? What has God given us in work? What does it mean to work as a Christian? How does the gospel change how you work? You know, think about it. Why do you work? Is it about just getting money? Is it about getting enough money so that you don't have to work? You know, that's what many people see work as. Work is simply a means to leisure. Why do you work? So that you don't have to. You know, and work is so, is so difficult. Why is that? Why does God want us to work? And how does the gospel change work? And how does the gospel speak into our work lives? And so the passage that we're going to look at today is Colossians 3, verse 17. And this passage speaks about a host of things, but it also speaks of work. What Paul says in in this verse is this, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to look at this passage and we're going to hear the gospel from this passage, but we're also going to see it in terms of work and how this passage provides us with a, with a vision, a vision for how the gospel relates to our work. We're going to see a renewed and redemptive vision for work in our lives. 
So let's begin by looking at this passage. So if you, if you have your Bibles out, if you look with me, Colossians 3, 17. The Apostle Paul here is concluding a section. This verse is something of the culmination of this section. And what he says here is, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So notice these words. And whatever you do, literally what it says there is, in all you do. And then it says, in word or deed, which is simply another way of saying everything is sort of the totality of human action. It's just a, a way of speaking. So it's another way of saying everything. And then he repeats it again, do it all. So in everything, whatever you do, everything, word and deed, everything, do it all. He's being incredibly emphatic. Whatever he's talking about right here, it has to do with all of life. It's not just about being in church. It's not just about your, what you do around Christians. It's not just what you do in your family. No, it's all of life. Everything. And this verse 17 is a, is a culmination of what he's been talking about in the previous verses. If you look at the verses that come before verse 17 in chapter 3, what's Paul talking about? He's talking about how you have put on the new self. He's talking, he says in verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not the things that are on earth. What he's saying is that we have been saved in Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed, set free from sin. And we've been, we've been renewed, given new life with Christ. And what he says in these verses is, you know, put off the old. Put off the things that are connected to the life you were set free from. Set your minds on the things that you have been set free for. Long to be remade after the image of Jesus. Long to, long to experience that new life that Christ has won for you. And so what he's saying is, you've been radically saved. You've been not only saved from something, you've been saved to something. And God's changing you. Put on that new nature that you have received in Jesus Christ. You're radically changed, both within and without. The gospel of God's grace. The gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ that changes us. The knowledge that we are sinners saved by Jesus Christ. The knowledge that we have been redeemed from sin. The knowledge that we have new life that changes us changes our loves, changes our desires, changes the way we relate to others, the, the way we speak, what we do. The peace of Christ, as Paul says it earlier in the passage. And he says, verse 14 and 15, or sorry, verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Just this peace that transcends the, the shalom, the wholeness of Christ. May it rule in your hearts. And then so verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Just the knowledge of the gospel, just let it dwell in your heart. And then sing to each other. It just overflows. It overflows into everything that we do. Verse 17. One commentator was looking at this passage and used this line. It's a line I, I really, I just love. It says, the best way to tell someone's carrying a full bucket of water is their feet are wet. It's got a profound and simple wisdom to it. The best way to tell someone's carrying a full bucket is they've got wet feet. Does the gospel impact you that much? Is it overflowing your life? Do you have wet feet? You know, have you been overwhelmed by the gospel of grace, of what God has done in Jesus Christ, about how God has shone the light 
of His Son into your life, freeing you, giving you new life, new meaning, new purpose? And has the gospel just so overflowed your heart that it's radically changed the way you view your life, the way you view your purpose, your place? Or do you pretty much view things simply the way everybody else around you does? Does your life operate on the same principles as the rest of the world? Have you perhaps compartmentalized different parts of your life and said, Jesus is for this part of my life, but not this part? Is the gospel simply something you know, something for your little community here, for our church community, for your Christian life? Or is it something that has transformed all of your life and how you relate in all aspects of your life? And how does work fit into that? Is work part of the all, the everything that Paul's talking about here? Now, we know the answer is yes, but sometimes we actually live as though it's no, don't we? You know, seven, eight years ago, I was at a conference, and there was a session at the conference on faith and work, and the speaker was talking about just how work is worship and how, how all work is, is so important and equally glorifying to God and of equal worth. That it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a plumber or a framer or a doctor or a lawyer or a garbage collector or whatever. There is no hierarchy as though this is more worshipful. No, all of life is worship. Work is worship. And then somebody stood up and asked him a question and said, how can you say that my job as an accountant is as God-glorifying as the job of a pastor. And it just struck me that as I heard the question, it was inconceivable to this man that his work, that his job was actually an act of worship that was pleasing to God, that was God-glorifying, that was worship. And I think we have that too, don't we? You know, perhaps you have a job that you don't like or you've got a difficult boss. Perhaps you feel like your work is somewhat insignificant in the idea that it could be God-glorifying, that it could be part of some incredible recreative work that God is doing in the world just seems so far away. Now, perhaps you can see that your work is important because you can work to support ministry. Or perhaps that you can do some sort of ministry at your work. You can lead a prayer meeting or you can share the gospel. But your actual work itself, being part of your your spiritual act of worship, that's a little bit far. But the gospel is that it is. Everything, all of life is caught up. And that means that your work is part of your redeemed and renewed life in Jesus Christ. And may that give you a new vision for how you look at your work, for how you look at everything that you do. Whatever work you do, you're treading on holy ground. You're doing something that's part of your new life in Jesus Christ. Your work matters. The gospel transforms your work, and it gives you a new and a glorious vision of your work. You work for your Lord, Jesus Christ. And that's the next thing that Paul really focuses on. He says there in verse 17, you know, you got that sort of threefold everything. Everything, everything, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an interesting phrase, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he mean by that? You know, there's two things that we can kind of pull out of this. In the Old Testament, you had in the name of the Lord. Or the name of the Lord. What's interesting is that Paul's now saying the name of Jesus. The Lord Jesus. There is this, in the Old Testament when that phrase was used, it was connected to to God. It was bearing His name. You know, at the end of the service, you're going to receive that blessing that Israel would receive as well. Where the Lord placed His name on the Israelites. And blessed them. But that, so the name of the Lord meant they were connected to the name of the Lord. It meant that they were also not only 
in, in relationship with him, but in some way they were, they were called to reflect his character. The name of the Lord Jesus. Do all your work in the name of the Lord Jesus, bearing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also that, that phrase, the name of the Lord Jesus, has this connection to salvation. Acts 4.12. You know, there the, the apostles are on trial before the Jewish rulers. And they're talking about the Lord Jesus. And they say there, when they're told not to speak in His name, they speak about who Jesus is. And they say, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's a powerful passage. No other name. The name of Jesus, that's where salvation is found. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, same thing. Speaking of the name of Jesus which saves us. Salvation is found in the name of Jesus. You do your work, you do all of life in the name of Jesus, bearing His name, following Him. You're redeemed by Him, renewed by Him. Renewed by His Spirit. He's your Master. He's your Lord. And that's something to think about in terms of your work. When you think about work, you think about your master. Who is your Lord? Who is your king? And what Paul's saying here in Colossians 3 is that, especially in verse 17, you have a new Lord. It's Jesus Christ. These other things, they don't master you. The things of the earth, they don't master you. You have a new Lord, you have Jesus Christ, and you're conformed, you follow His image. You're, you're formed after His image. And that means the way that you work is transformed. You know, Paul, earlier in the letter, Colossians 2, 6, you know, says, you know, just as, it says there in verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. They've received Jesus Christ as Lord. Now continue to walk in Him. That's what he's saying here. And the gospel means that we live out the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ in our personal life. You know, we, we're continually being renewed after the image of Jesus Christ. Our, our loves, our desires, our wants, our, our actions being just transformed, renewed personally. But having Him as Lord also means that we begin to follow our king and we fight with him. We, we begin to be a redemptive and renewing presence in our world. It means that the way we relate to our husbands, our wives, our children, our friends, our employers, our employees, our community, our church communities, it's all transformed. You take a look at what Paul does after Colossians 3.15 or 3.17. 3, if you open your Bible, what you'll see is he begins to then work this out in a series of different relationships. He talks to wives, talks to husbands, talks to children, talks to parents, talks to servants or slaves, talks to masters. 4 verse 5 and 6, he talks about interacting as Christians with those outside of the church. Jesus Christ is your Lord. You do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. And so that changes the way you relate, changes the way you do family, the way you do marriage, the way you're a neighbor. It also changes the way you work. It also changes how you view work. Think about that. Why do you work? Like, what's the reason for your work? You know, is it for financial security? Is it for, for leisure? Is it for holidays, for retirement? Is that why you work? 
I think generally in the world around us, that's why people work. They work so that they can retire early. They work so they can go on great holidays. No, I'm not saying that you can't retire. I'm not saying you can't have, you know, cottages or go on cruises or go to resorts. But the danger is that the world's way of viewing work begins to impact the way you view work. And it impacts your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you do your work in the name of having a good holiday, if you do your work in the name of having a good income, if you do your work in the name of having a good retirement, it changes the way you view your work. It changes the way you view the place of Jesus Christ in your life. It somehow diminishes the light of the gospel because something else becomes bigger and better news for you. And think about it this way. If your investment's tanked right now, if all the work of your hands over the last 20, 40 years just disappeared, what would your work have meant? Now, I'm not saying that it won't mean anything to lose it. That's a horrible thing, and I I hope and pray that doesn't happen for you. But if... Everything you worked for, if all the things that you achieved, all the things you amassed through your work, if they went away, does that mean your work was meaningless, wasted? Because if that's the measure of your success, if that's a measure of what makes work meaningful and gives it purpose, then it is fleeting And it is on shaky ground. Your work can become our master in the sense that it conditions our values. It sets our priorities. It becomes a cruel master. But the gospel is that you leave all of that way of looking at work way of looking at life, you leave it behind because you say, I follow the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus gives you security for your work. Having Jesus Christ as Lord gives you security for your work. And having the Lord Jesus as your Lord gives your work meaning and purpose in a way like no other can give. It gives you security because you know that you follow your Lord. And that He holds your whole life in your hands. That whatever you do, you simply follow Him, you trust Him, and you do the work for Him. You know, Psalm 127, beautiful psalm about, you know, unless the Lord blesses the house, you know, the workers labor in vain. But also at the end of verse 2, the Lord even blesses us while we sleep. Jesus Christ is your Lord. That means that you can have this security and this confidence as you do your work. That you work for the King. And that His work is held in your hand. Or his, your work is held in His hands. That you're called to trust Him and follow Him. And that your work has meaning and purpose beyond this life, beyond this earth, It has meaning. It is, you have security in your work because it's established by God. And that work has meaning and purpose because you work for the King. You work for the Lord Jesus. I'm working for the one who so loved me and gave his son Jesus for me. We were created to participate in and enjoy God's work in creation, to fill the earth, subdue it. Genesis 1. You know, after the fall, that work became more difficult, but it continues. And in Jesus Christ, we can say that our labor is not in vain. You know, when you work for the Lord, your work participates in His creative work, participates in His redemptive acts. It's life-giving, it's life-affirming. It gives your work meaning and purpose in a way that no other way of viewing work can do. 
And it's solid. It's based on the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who is, the God who created, the God who redeemed, the God who recreates and renews. And then finally, Paul continues. You do all of this giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You know, your work is an expression of thankfulness to God. Colossians 1, 21 and 22, Paul is speaking to the Colossians about how they were once separated from God, but now they've been brought near to God through Jesus Christ. Their life now is an expression of thankfulness to God for what He has done in Jesus. They're now part of the covenant people. They were once far away, but now they were brought near. All that Israel had, the covenant people, they now have. The promises, new life, new hope. It's all theirs. And Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the one through whom all these blessings come. They're forgiven and made right with God through Jesus. They have access to God with confidence through Jesus. They have union with Christ and access to God through Jesus' union with God. We're joined to Jesus by faith. And that means we give thanks to God the Father through Jesus, connected to Him. Our life is a response of thankfulness to the God who is there and the God who has loved us in His Son. And that means we get to live all of life with a thankfulness mindset instead of an achievement mindset. That's something to think about when you think about your vision of what work is and having a redeemed and renewed vision of work in your life. If you work from a thankfulness mindset or if you work from an achievement mindset, it just transforms the way you work and how you view your work. Your work is an act of thankfulness and worship, and God sees it in that light. And that changes how you judge your work. You know, if you work and work, and you lose your business because something happens in the economy, or some unforeseen event happens, if you are living with this achievement mindset, Everything is lost. But if you do your work with a thankfulness mindset, your work was always an act of thankfulness, and the achievement becomes less. If the achievement's up here and thankfulness to God is down here, something's wrong. And you're going to have difficulties when it comes to work. Work is always going to be toil. And it's not going to be done out of thankfulness. It's going to be done out of fear because you want to achieve something. But if all of life is thankfulness and if your work is an act of thankfulness, the achievements are great, but they're not everything. This thankfulness is your starting point. And so your work then is motivated by grace, a response to God's grace. I am a hell-deserving sinner. I'm worse than I could ever imagine. But I have been forgiven. I've been redeemed. I've been given new life in Jesus Christ through His life, through His death. And I can do all things. I can go through all things because I know what He did. I know God's love. And I I have this underlying and unshakable sense of, of thankfulness to the God who so loved me. And gave me this in Jesus. That I have a hope and a future that's unshakable in Jesus Christ. He created me. He loved me. And even though I'm a sinner, He gave me a job to do in the middle of this sin-broken world. And I get to work for Him. We all have a garden to tend and to spread. 
we were created to work. We were created to work a garden. The fall made that job so much more difficult. We're experiencing that right now with COVID-19. This is not the way it's supposed to be. But in Christ, we know that we have been redeemed from that fall. That He has redeemed us, that He has saved us, and that He is remaking us after His image, and we get to participate in His work. That we get to be this renewing presence, this redemptive presence in our world. And that extends to our work. So do you want to get back to work? You know, is your work defined by your job or is it defined by the Lord Jesus? Raised with Jesus Christ, following Jesus. Do your work. Use this time right now to reflect on why you work. Reflect on the brokenness of this world in which you work and how the Lord Jesus has given you a renewed and redemptive vision for work. Let's now come before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, please help us to see our work rightly. And Lord, in this time of COVID-19, May you give us eyes to see what work is and why we work. May we have a renewed appreciation for work. Not only in terms of why we work, but, but the value of work in your eyes. May we be given confidence as we do our work. And may we see our work as, as being something that is restorative, redemptive, renewing. May we be a breath of fresh air in whatever place we work. And Lord, we pray that you would give us a renewed vision of work. Lord, if we were caught up in an old way of seeing our work, if it was just seen in terms of making money, if it was just seen in terms of, of giving us something like leisure or security or retirement, that we would see the wonder of what work is for work's sake that we would see its place in our redeemed and renewed life, our walk with Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would bless the work of our hands. We pray that you would give us work that we may do and that we may do it to your glory and for your honor. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us so that we will do work in a way that brings glory to your name and which is a blessing to the city in which you've placed us, a blessing to the companies that we work for. Father, renew us more and more by your Spirit. May we more and more be conformed to the image of your Son as we do our work. Please hear our prayer, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's now sing in response to the proclamation of the gospel. We'll sing Psalm 25, stanzas 1 and 2.
Let's now come before the Lord in prayer. Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we praise you and we adore you. We thank you, Father, for the marvelous work that you have done. We thank you for your work of creation, for your work of redemption, for your work of recreation in us by your Spirit. We thank you for what you have given to us in Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would more and more transform our lives, that more and more we would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, especially today for our work. Lord, we live in uncertain times. We confess that we are afraid, that we are concerned about what's going to happen in the future. We don't know. We don't know how things are going to go as, as the governments try to, both local and federal, try to reopen the economy. We don't know how things are going to look when we get back to work as we normally have been. We don't know if our jobs will be the same. We don't know if our jobs will be there. We pray, Father, that you would bless and prosper our work. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to trust in you, that we would continue to rest in you, our Lord and Savior, our Lord and King, that you would give us the confidence and the peace that we can only have knowing that we work in your pleasure, that we work in your love and in your grace, and that everything that we do is a response to you, a response of thankfulness, and that we simply trust in you and follow you. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength to do that, but we also pray, Lord, that you would establish the work of our hands. We know that our work is pleasing to you. It is glorifying to you. And so we pray, Lord, that for that sake, for your sake, you would prosper it and bless it. But Lord, we also know that our work means that we can support ourselves and our families, that we can support the ministry of the gospel, the proclamation of your name. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the means to, to not only support ourselves, but to support the ministry of the gospel and also those who have needs. And Lord, we also know that our work is a blessing to the city in which we live and that it means so much to our neighbors. And so we pray that you would bless and establish the work of our hands for the sake of our neighbors. And Lord, we pray that you would be with our government, give them wisdom as they open up the economy again. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless their efforts. We pray, Lord, that there would be an end to this COVID-19. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength for all our tasks. We pray, Father, that you would be with teachers. We pray that you would be with doctors and nurses. We pray that you would be with those involved with law enforcement. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who own companies. We pray that you would be with those who have been laid off. We pray that you would be with those who have had their work descriptions greatly altered over the last, last couple of months. We pray that you would bless each and every one of us as we do our work. And Lord, today, especially on Mother's Day, we also remember the work of mothers. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the women in our midst to our mothers, that you would, you would equip them for their task. We pray, Lord, that you would establish the work of their hands, that you would give them strength for it, and that you would bless them as they do it. We pray, Father, that you would also be with us, that we would express our thank to them, that we would appreciate the work they do and we would show them how much we value it. And Lord, we also pray that you would be with those among us who are not mothers and who would long to be and for whom this day may have a bit of a sting. We pray, Father, that you would give them peace, that you would give them strength. We pray, Lord, that you would Give them a peace that rests in you and which finds its hope in you. We pray, Father, that you would 
you would provide them with all that they stand in need of. And Father, we also pray that you would be with us as a church community. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we continue to work in our community. Father, bless the work of our hands. May it bring praise, glory, and honor to you. And Father, we pray that you would bless us as we go forward from this service. We pray that you would bless us as we take up our task tomorrow. May you bless us and bless the work of our hands and make it a blessing. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 through 17, we read these words. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world, the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now, together with the church of all times and places, make profession of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Say with me in your hearts. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and became incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he arose, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. And we believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As our closing song, we'll now sing hymn 85, verses 1, 2, and 3. Thank you. 
Father, bless us now as we go from here. Father, we go from here bearing your name, and we pray that you would bless us and make us a blessing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord and go your way in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. As our parting song, we will sing, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. Jesus' name.